I've been in the hardwoods industry for 30 years, uh, initially with a, a local authority, county council, uh, but more predominantly as a, a consultant and a, a contractor. Um, and most recently with Tarmac, who I joined in September 2018. So um, in the 20 minutes I've got available to me, um, I would say it's uh, impossible to cover all the bases for this topic, um, but I'll touch on some of what I consider to be the key themes. And I would start by saying that the, the role of material suppliers in delivering resilient infrastructure to respond to challenges such as climate change and population growth, I think is often underestimated. So at Tarmac, we believe we're able to add real value to our customers by understanding their challenges. So helping them to uh, embed uh, whole life thinking and to work more sustainably by responding to the increase in need to optimise design, construction, maintenance and performance of building and infrastructure, including roads. So when I was asked to speak about resilience in roads, I had to consider what it meant for me. So whilst also not trying, trying not to repeat what had already been said during the regional workshops that James alluded to um, a couple of years ago that were facilitated by WSP and Tarmac. Um, easier said than done. So the model that you, you can see here, um, it could also be applied to a number of different themes, I would say, so such as collaboration, efficiency and effectiveness. But it works for resilience as well, picking up all, all the themes that Chris alluded to earlier. So Tarmac's a, a large organisation and we've got a large footprint. And it's also integrated into the fabric of roads construction and maintenance in the UK. So little known fact that I didn't know before I joined Tarmac, so we're the biggest, fifth biggest landowner in the UK, over 100,000 acres of land. We're in the top three private sector users of rail freight and one of the largest vehicle logistics companies in the UK too. So the fact that Tarmac is such a large organisation and so, it's so integral to the way Britain's roads are built and maintained means we've got a responsibility to ensure we integrate resilience into everything that we do. As the UK's lead in materials and construction solutions business, we've put sustainability and innovation front and centre, developing products and solutions that not only safely deliver the infrastructure needed to grow the UK economy, but also to help create a more sustainable built environment. However, the areas that I will touch on today are equally relevant to all organisations working in the highways industry, contractor, consultant, local authorities. And these are asset management, effective delivery and circular economy. So from an asset management perspective, um, I would say it's a, sh a shared challenge. Uh, so the decline of the local road network started a long time ago and it's principally as a result of years of underinvestment. Uh, consequently, we're all playing a never-ending cyclical game of catch-up with a maintenance backlog reported recently of approximately 10 years. But when I talk to highways officers and heads of service, one of their overriding concerns isn't just the highways funding shortfall and wider local authority cuts, it's also the lack of financial certainty from one political cycle to the next. So councils urgently need the stability of a five-year investment strategy in local roads, and we must continue as an industry to lobby central government for this, including through the current CIHT log review. The local road network needs greater par uh, parity with the strategic network. So the combination of network decline, the funding landscape, and a need, of, a need for greater resilience all make asset management now even more critical. And they're driving councils to think creatively about how they can raise additional finance to deliver highways and renewal programmes. So whilst the DFT self-assessment process that Steve alluded to earlier has undoubtedly raised performance and driven the asset management agenda, particularly outside London, I do think there remains a lack of high quality highway data analysis to enable local authorities to truly un uh, demonstrate an informed risk-based approach to maintenance programmes. So going forward, this will be a fundamental requirement of the DF DFT to ensure future budget certainty, particularly from next year. So many local authorities are looking at different strategies and techniques to obtain accurate data about the condition of their networks. Data and how it is presented is key to making a meaningful case to elected members for investment in renewals programmes or to sell back the benefits of the work they've done. Developing fully comprehensive inventories is, is essential to enable the production of life cycle models which can demonstrate funding requirements and lead to planned long-term maintenance models. 
So many condition surveys are linear and therefore don't provide a true representation of the asset. They can't provide the level of detail needed to assess footways and carriageways to make accurate evaluations and develop investment models. But just obtaining the data isn't enough. Analysis is vital and councils need to work with partners who can provide an accurate idea of target costs as well as an understanding of the kind of materials that could be deployed to ensure durable and cost-effective whole life treatments for the network. I would caveat this by saying once an authority has developed the right policies compliant to the code of practice that Steve mentioned earlier, a maturity assessment would probably add a lot of value, helping them objectively understand how effective their asset management practices are. In, in reality, the DFT questionnaire should do this, even for London authorities. The final bit around asset management, I think um, local authorities need to select the right partners. So I know all local authorities maintain the networks in the best interest of taxpayers and the communities they serve. That's, that's obviously their, their reason for being. Um, but there's an opportunity to make an even more compelling case to their elected members for investment if they can demonstrate the social impact of failing roads. So Tarmac's experience, experiences in Blackpool through uh, Project 30, uh, Nottinghamshire and more recently Rutland, where we've worked with a technology data collection company and an asset management consultant to develop compelling business cases to secure additional funding aimed at tackling the maintenance backlog evidences this. So in Nottinghamshire, for example, we work with Nottinghamshire County Council, along with our partners, data specialist Gaist and asset management consultancy Metis, to help make the case for significant investment to deliver improvements to the A38, A617 corridor. So the work included assembling detailed and accurate condition data, but crucially, it also provided important context on housing and employment growth along the route, as well as its economic value in connecting residents to the wider strategic road network. So with ex excellent asset knowledge, there is the opportunity to make evidence-based decisions. At Tarmac, we're excited by new partnerships too. So they're providing us with additional expertise in the age of digital construction. Uh, a company, well, I'll show you a quick video in, in a second, uh, called Robotics, was spawned from a research project where a smartphone tool was developed that uses machine learning, AI, to identify road defects to help steer connected and autonomous vehicles safely around them. Uh, robotics currently operate in 100 uh, authorities across 18 US states and 8 countries, and we're currently considering introducing them into the UK market. Robotics is all about creating objective and affordable road assessments. Communities, governments, municipalities, they're responsible for a portion of the road network. The first challenge that they have though is trying to understand what is the current status of the road network today. Easiest way you could do that is you go out in a car, you drive the entire road network and you take a look at it. There could be cracks, there could be potholes, and all of these surface distresses that tell you something about the status of that road network. What Roadbotics does is we use a smartphone and AI, and we can go out and we can take video data in that same pattern that then gets uploaded into our cloud systems where we can process that data looking for the same distresses. Except now it's a machine that's doing it that's creating an objective profile of your entire road network. And we can do it very quickly and very affordably. This gives communities, those same road managers, access to a quantitative data set that they can then make decisions from. Do they need more budget? Do they need less budget? Where should they put those resources? Should it be on that road or that road? Robotics is sort of a small example of a, of a greater trend of using artificial intelligence to replace menial work you can do it systematically. And by that, you can increase transparency and equity. The whole idea started with me getting this small grant at CMU as a researcher. And so I developed my idea there, developed the algorithm. And now to see that it actually is used in a company and uh, gets recognition, that it's really, that's really great. Because it's not just that the algorithms worked, but it's actually real world applications. As Steve says, there are other similar uh, companies. We, we're not a Tarmac isn't a sponsor of robotics. I'll just hasten to add, uh, which is just one option that we're looking at at the moment, and they seem to be a pretty good option at the moment as well. Um, the only thing, other thing that I was going to touch on on the previous slide, the comment around scanner. Um, so there's a well, two or three local authorities that I've spoken to that are running um, data collection systems that are outside of a scanner system, um, and their view is that they'll twin track it for the next two or three years or so, and then hopefully get a, a, a dispensation to stop using scanner uh, at a point in time when they can demonstrate that they've reconciled the data between the two. 
So we'll see how we're going on that one. Collecting data shouldn't just stop at condition surveys and mapping the state of the asset. So implementing a data-led approach to highways design, construction and maintenance offers, I think, an, an exciting range of benefits. So data provides the opportunity to take a more imaginative approach to demonstrating and considering the social, economic and environmental value of highways. It enables a circular way of building a design, better resource efficiency and better decision making across an asset life cycle. So with the availability and shareability of data increasing every day, and with the way that techno uh, technology companies are integrating big data, we've got unprecedented scope to organise, rationalise and impact the way we design and manage the highways assets and help wider society with smarter, greener and more efficient movement of people and goods. So an area that Tarmac has addressed through the introduction of best in class technology solutions is on-site delivery of roadworks. So this is just a small, relatively small part of the, the whole resilience uh, picture, I'd say. But So some of the issues that are prevalent uh, that we found in all uh, construction ex activities which we've tackled include planning not being systemised or robust as it could be, so resource over and under allocated, particularly across our materials plants. Uh, very little continuous improvement, particularly day to day during a project. Uh, so just carry on doing what they were doing the previous day, not, not learning from it. So communications between site teams and materials delivery vehicles and materials plants were very ad hoc and often ineffective. Um, materials waste as well uh, due to delivery vehicles taking longer to get to site than envisaged and or planning activities being completed too soon or too late. Negative impact on road users and residents due to poor forecasting of time required to complete the works and guesswork at the level of compaction achieved across the material that we've laid, expensive material that we've laid. Inaccurate material volume and works duration information leading to commercial disputes. So just a, a number of issues that, uh, that, that pre-exist. So the new technology that we've introduced, which is an amalgam of a number of system, ha systems harnessed by an integrator, has provided an opportunity for data to support a productive and an efficient construction process, as well as to be collected and harvested from the laying process when works are taking place. So effectively, we joined up the dots between pl uh, planning and on-site delivery through all the phases from material collection to transportation to the on-site delivery. So at the planning stage, the project is overlaid on a mapping interface, which faci facilitates the, the addition of specific points of interest, for example, bridges, overhead lines. So this brings huge safety benefits because the construction team follow the works plan via their vehicle mounted and handheld devices which instantly alert the team to the presence of specific points of interest and their exact uh, geo-reference location. Material delivery vehicles are fitted with technology systems which record where they have collected their load from and when, the material from the materials plants, and then tracks their journey to site, with a display on the paver monitoring the estimated time of arrival. So this simple addition enables the paving operators to slow up or speed down their operations enabling a seamless transition to deliveries and removing the possibility of cold joints. And also by using sensors on the paving and compaction equipment during the laying process, which also removes inspectors from harm's way, data is collected and recorded regarding the quality of the installation from the type of material, uh, type and temperature of materials used and the ambient weather conditions. So not only are key metrics regarding the pavement installation recorded by the technology, but operators are also provided with live, real-time guidance to improve the laying and compaction quality. A colour-coded in-cab readout allows the roller driver, for example, to see how many passes have been completed on the new surface, which enables them to avoid spending too much time in one location and focus on the cooler areas first. So the data also confirms that first pass temperatures have been achieved even, evenly. So once laying is completed, the system matches the GPS location data to generate an electronic laying and compaction record for each load. This data set is then uploaded onto a software system and mapped, providing our clients with permanent on-demand access to the laying and compaction record. And this data will help inform future maintenance decisions when reconciled against condition surveys. It will also allow for the creation of more accurate predictive modeling algorithms. Modeling algorithms. So the live nature of the, the paperless based system provides supervisors and managers with rich data in, an, in real time, enabling quick decisions to be made. So the software uses inbuilt value analysis to predict time to complete projects, enabling manual, manual interventions, which may include resource adjustments up or down to more effectively deliver against the desired programme. The open nature of the system, which we share with our clients, helps build trust across the whole team. We're not the only contractor investing in these types of systems, but hopefully it's providing an awareness of the art of the possible. You don't have to, deliver, uh, to leave on-site delivery to chance. 
So the final thing that I'll touch on is, uh, is around circular economy. So we've already heard today from, from Chris um, on some of the challenges and opportunities facing future infrastructure development and how we can begin to embed network resilience. So our highway networks, along with the whole of our transport system, are undergoing major change with automated vehicles coming online and electric cars rising up the political agenda offering significant improvements on the safety, efficiency, accessibility and sustainability of how we travel. So a couple of years ago, Tarmac and WSP embarked on a, a project to establish what the creation of a circular economy meant to our industry and how we should respond to it for the benefit of our shareholders as well as future generations. So the graphic pretty much says it all. Um, our society is hungry and it's getting hungrier despite the efforts of the Paris Agreement and similar enact enactments to stem the tide. And as with any business, there's a constant driver to reduce costs to maintain our competitive position. Planning consents referenced in the top right hand corner, that relates to our quarrying activities. So the licenses under which the quarries, op quarries operate are strict and are becoming more onerous as virgin aggregates become more scarce. So increasing regulation refers to things like vehicle emissions, asphalt production techniques, and extraction of more raw materials amongst others. So our clients expect, expect us to support and transition to a circular economy as a matter of course, although there is still something of a disconnect caused by short funding cycles, which tends to stifle progress on a cost basis due to not being able to adopt whole life cost solutions. So climate change, as has been touched on earlier uh, a number of times, is undoubtedly one of the greatest threats to our networks as they become subjected to very different climatic conditions over their design life. The costs of not adapting could be vast in terms of traffic disruption, public safety and infrastructure repairs. This is a very real challenge having an influence on how UK highways networks are managed today. Drier summers are undoubtedly causing more instances of subsidence and wetter winters and winter ingression are severely affecting the network. The pace of change is undoubtedly accelerating and it's exciting and challenging to look ahead to where infrastructure, in particular for us today, highways design and use could be in 10, 20, 50 years time. The opportunity to embrace, to embrace innovation has never been greater. Different and more collaborative ways of working are needed to deliver asset renewal not just to tackle network decline today, but to future-proof the asset. So two years ago, we made some firm and, and pretty correct commitments. So we vowed to apply circular economy thinking to help our customers and clients choose the most efficient products, services and solutions for their projects. Accelerate the transition to a circular economy by designing sustainable products, services and solutions to minimize, maximize the value of resources throughout their life. Optimize the use of other people's waste as raw materials and fuels in our products and processes. Collaborate with our supply chain and anticipate future customer needs. Innovate new products, services and solutions that reduce the use of scarce resources, extending design life and facilitating repurposing at the end of the current life. Reducing, reusing, recycling to achieve zero to landfill from our operations. And also educating our business and embedding a, a culture of circular economy into our procurement, operational commercial activities, language and thinking. Some, some pretty and so pr pr pretty bold and correct uh, things to, uh, to try and achieve. So where are we now? Well, from a, a long list of 50 potential projects that the steering group identified, they selected a top six after testing each one against a, pre a set of predefined criteria. So of the six, the first two in the table that you see before you are particularly relevant to highways. I think it's fair to say that we haven't moved the agenda forward as far as we'd like to have done as I stand here now, um, and that's a as a result of competing business, business imperatives. Uh, but a lot of good work has been done, not just by Tarmac, so across the industry. And we do find ourselves at a place of great opportunity. There's a lot of change in the market and in a seemingly voracious appetite for innovation, supported by a healthy attitude to risk by our clients and policymakers, and of course the maturity of the burgeoning technology revolution. So this graphic on this slide illustrates the opportunities at various stages in the construction and maintenance of roads. And by opportunity, I mean areas where development of a circular economy approach should be developed. So if you look at the integrated service model, for example, um, we're introducing railheads uh, to a lot of our uh, quarrying uh, facilities and asphalt plants, um, making sure that our vehicles are best in class, clocks compliant, four silver, four gold as a minimum. Uh, from the repurposing perspective, so certainly reducing reliance on virgin uh, aggregates, virgin materials. Uh, PSV 65 stone is, is particularly uh, scarce at the moment and costs are likely to increase. And also increasing the use of uh, wrap uh, into our materials, so the, bain, uh, the base cores and the binder cores in particular, but um, also uh, 
investigating the, um, the, the, the potential for introducing it into the surface course too. So I won't run through the videos. <laughs> <laughs> and I wasn't actually planning to run through the videos, actually, to be fair, on these ones. But, um, but you can look at them at your leisure at, uh, at any point in time you like. Um, but what I, what I would say is the increase in asphalt product portfolios in recent years is, is a really good illustration of the changes that we're driving in the highways industry. And this applies equally to our competitors. So the options of new, more sustainable innovations available to highway engineers today, you'll no doubt be familiar with. Things like warm mix. Low energy material is becoming more prevalent. A great amount of, amount of wrap content is being used and the ability to batch and store asphalt in hot boxes means it doesn't need to be constantly reheated, lowering en uh, energy uses and improving repair work. And the point is that it doesn't have to be HRA and chips. So whilst that option does still offer a place, still does have a place in the, uh, the industry, there are many other options that offer a myriad of other benefits, including whole life cost, carbon reduction, minimisation of disruption through single layer application, etc. So our technical teams, and as I say, competitors have the, the, the same offer, to be fair to them. Our technical teams are available to provide free technical advice, and they use an electronic product uh, selection tool which identifies the most beneficial solutions for your particular scheme based on various inputs provided by you. Give them a go. <laughs>